this out in the garden today, and I'm going to be different. Let's see. I'm going to add one. Um, yeah. Let's go with this one. Have um, some hibiscus. Yeah, that's nice. one. Um, I have some hibiscus uh, in my front yard, and they're coming in really, really nice. It's that's they're not well. Yeah, that's the when you see the Hawaiian shirts. That's a hibiscus mm -hmm. flower, which the, the, I diff, I think it's a different variety slightly that grows in Hawaii, but that's where they get. So their hibiscus shirts are the hibiscus flower, and I'm able to grow some here in Virginia. So they come in really nice. So I thought I'd change things up for my background today. <laughs> yeah, it looks, looks good. Can you eat them? Hmm? Can you eat them? No. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't occur hasn't occurred to me. <laughs> I'm sure my, my pig would tell me that uh, everything is edible. Once. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, everything is edible and everything is edible once. <laughs> I will. Are hibiscus poisonous to dogs? Hmm? Yes, hibiscus flowers, leaves, and seeds are edible. And they wow. used oh, they used them to make herbal tea. So oh, wow. So yeah. So I have uh, yeah one of the flowers. I'm doing. Uh, let me open it up. Boom, ba -dum, boom, boom, boom. This one. I'll go and share that while we're sitting around here waiting on people. Um, there, where you at? Let me hang on. I've lost everything on my screen. Over there, find the Zoom meeting again, and then let's see. Uh, I guess I gotta try again. Share screen. Oh, there it is. Show that for a moment. There. That is one right. of them. Made that That's my profile pick for the day. That's gorgeous. I mean, they, yeah. they come in so nice. I went out today just to um, just to pick all the... You can see it behind me if you look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There. <laughs> As they droop, I went, they, they turn like dark purple and, and droop. And I went out today just to tidy up and, and pick the ones that had drooped. You know, because they die and you make room for other ones, right? Yeah. So I just started yeah. me to go out and take care of that today. And I'm like, well, those look really pretty. So let me go and get a picture. Yeah, the, so. the phrase for what you're doing uh, in the UK is called deadheading. Yes, yes. I've heard that. Yes. Yeah. I, I, it's um, something I would love to do, but it's peeing it down with rain again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do. Okay. I don't quite have a black thumb. I have a dark green thumb. <laughs> <laughs> if I make an effort, I can make things grow. But I, I, it's generally, it's like, I'm very good at planting. If you just brought me mm -hmm. in to plant all the flowers, I can properly put down the soil and the, the weed and feed, the shaken seed and, and, and get them started. But yeah. then remembering to watering them on a regular basis is where I fail. And then so a lot of them tend to die along the way. So <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I'm busy with other things. It's like I'm not a full time gardener. But uh, I mean, I can do okay. And like weeding, my front yard gets a ton of weeds. I mean, that garden just gets so much. And I got to, it's like literally, they're almost some of them as high as what you see there was the weeds before I got there. Like, okay, I really need to do something because I've got shoots. And I'm like, I need to get rid of them. It, so. <laughs> so you've got grass in that as well, have you? Mm hmm. Yeah. I've got a regular yard, a regular grass yard. <laughs> From my point of view, that's not a regular yard. A yard would be something that's concreted. Well, this, okay. Well, <laughs> it, it's very much an American thing. And I recognize it's yeah. like, you know, it's sort of silly. It's like we grow grass, we can't eat it, and we spend a yeah. lot of time cutting it down so it doesn't even grow to its full height. But it does not, I do miss Arizona because, of course, we can't really grow grass out there. So mm -hmm. everybody has like little pebble. They have yards made of yeah. little bitty pebbles and cacti, which you don't need to water. Just plant <laughs> them and leave them alone, and they'll they'll be fine. So I actually like that better because I never had to mow the lawn when I lived there. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a so what caused you to move? 
Oh, uh, 9 11. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had moved, we lived here. My wife wanted to be a funeral director and we oh, found right. a, a two year school in Mesa. Morning, Paul. Mm-hmm. And Morning, Paul. Uh, so we were living here in Virginia Beach. And I had just graduated college and we signed her up for college out there at Mesa Community College. And we got out there and she finished her degree and started an apprenticeship to right. be a funeral director. She had actually been a funeral director here was about 12 months, I think six, 12 months into her apprenticeship, but she needed the degree. So we moved to Phoenix. I moved out there. I didn't have a job. I found a job within a couple of weeks for my first real programming job. So I lucked mm-hmm. out and um, she went to school and she managed to basically cram half a semester into the summer and start in the fall wow. of the second year of her class. She, we were probably in like two years, get your first year of your obligatories. And then your second year is all one professor, six classes, and it's mm-hmm. all funeral science. So they said, well, if you just double up and take like four summer classes this summer, you can start this September. So like, let's do that. So she managed to graduate and started an apprenticeship. And um, so she got about 12 months into that. I lost my job because right after the economy was getting soft, the dot-com bubble had burst. It was like 2001. And then other companies were laying off. My company wasn't. And then 9-11 happened. And then a month later, I got laid off. So, mm-hmm. And then she heard her back at work, lifting a body of all things. And so she was out of work. And we don't have moved back here, which I hate because I love feelings. So then she couldn't count her 12 months of apprenticeship in Virginia in Arizona. And she went back to Virginia and she couldn't count her 12 months of apprenticeship in Arizona here in Virginia. And she couldn't count her earlier time. So she started her third apprenticeship. Take oh, <laughs> it through 18 months. And then I got, I was a, my, my job here at Langley Air Force Base, they transferred me up to DC area and she kept her job here and drove to work every day from Fredericksburg yeah. down to Newport News, about a hundred miles every, every day, because I'll be damned if I'm going to screw up another apprenticeship. <laughs> so she graduated, she finally finished her apprenticeship and then she got a job working in um, at a funeral home in Northern Virginia which was close to where we lived. And she actually, her company, the the funeral home, managed all of the intakes for Arlington National Cemetery. So any veterans who died who went to Arlington, yeah, they were the ones who handled it. She got a lot of experience dealing with um, with uh, military funerals and all that. And that was really cool. So, but yeah, I love Phoenix and it just was terrible, terrible circumstances. I would still be there today if it was for 9 <laughs> <laughs> and is your wife still a funeral director now? Actually, she stopped when our son was born, right. and um, and she was going to go back to it. And then she had she discovered she had MS about a year after she, he was born. Yeah. Her system went haywire, and so she mm-hmm. already thought she she figured she had it, but it had been confirmed. But yeah, she'd been struggling with MS ever since, and she never managed to go back to work, unfortunately. So she keeps wanting to. Mm-hmm. But I mean, he was like, yeah, as soon as he's in elementary school, I'll be able to go part time, whatever. And just the disease has kept her from doing that, which really sucks. Yeah. So she's basically yeah. a housewife. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Just a housewife? <laughs> <laughs> Keeping uh, you anyway. in the controlling. All right. Yeah. That is a full time job, yes. And she's <laughs> failed miserably. <laughs> Keeping me in control. Well, like an animal trainer, then, really. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Morning, Alan. Hello. Yeah. Morning, Alan. Hey, the funny thing is, it, it, Brian is like the military brought me to Virginia. I was from Seattle, so went across the coast, and and the Marines brought me here, and mm-hmm. I've managed to move several other places. It's kind of like the thing where you have like the, the the curved like the bowl where you have the marble, and it rolls up and down and rolls up, and it keeps returning to the center. That's me. I keep coming back to Virginia Beach no matter what mm-hmm. I do. <laughs> I keep moving away. And I keep moving back. So I finally gave up. I was like, I guess I meant to stay here <laughs> because circumstances keep bringing me back. So, so it's worked out for me. I mean, I I love it here in Virginia Beach. I really do. It's it's a nice area. It's it's not the big city, but it has some big city amenities. Not many, but <laughs> <laughs> but and it does not out in the middle of the country either. So it's a nice balance. 
And now with the freak, I, I wish this whole technology thing, the whole telecommunicate, this Zoom thing was an option years earlier because, you know, I could have just, there's several times I would have said, I wish I could just live here and work for that place there. And now I can and I'm settled. So go. <laughs> but I could, I could pack up today and go move anywhere in the country and still keep my work and, and find more telecommunicate work. So it's the next generation of kids will be able to say, I'm going to go live anywhere I want and work here. Yeah. And I think that's just awesome that technology has made that, that flexibility available. If you want to go live in the mountains, live in the mountains, but you can support a company in a major city. I don't know. I think this thing's going to change. Honestly, I think that's yeah. the technology will change how we do things. I think over time, companies are be forced to, like you'll see that leveling between the major cities that pay more because of the higher cost of living, but you have to live there to get the money that people can work remotely. You might actually see that evening out, but the only people that can't work remotely, of course, are sort of doctors, nurses, well, doctors and nurses to a degree can, you, you can be workers, yeah. sweet, yep. sweet cleaners and so on. But yeah, yeah, you can certainly do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, COVID made it possible. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot of work can be done. I mean, IT work, obviously, we should yeah. have been telecommuting a long time ago. It's like, I'm on a computer all day, is it really better? So, anyway. <laughs> One thing I've noticed is like Teams, which I think is mm -hmm. awesome. Microsoft Teams is awesome. And when I first did this stuff, when I was trying to plan out my unstated meetings, I looked at all the major video conferencing software out there okay i looked at g uh google's i looked at microsoft teams i looked at facebook i looked at zoom i looked at uh webex uh a couple other ones almost all of them some have advantages over zoom but the one thing zoom has that no other one has that i found is anybody can show up here i give you a link you show up if you want to use google you have to have a gmail account if you want to use microsoft teams you have to be a member of some group that uses that team. If you want to use Facebook, you have to have a Facebook account. All of them had some sort of limitation. And I was like, well, I'm thinking I want anybody anywhere in the world could, to join us. And that was the main thing for Zoom. But what's awesome about Teams is, and because I've dealt with remote, remoting into computers and stuff for years. Like someone, you're on your computer and you can't get something to open up. So I need to see your screen. So you have to have a special piece of software turned on on your machine and configured, and I have to have permissions to be able to remote in, and then I have to launch something, and you have to launch. It, it's a big thing, and I can't talk you through that most of the time. Teams, it's like click the share button and share your desktop, and that's my hardest. The hard biggest hurdle with with other people is explaining to them. Okay, look at your computer. Look for the big red button. Now, just to the left of that, there's a little window. Click that little thing. Getting them to click the share button is the hardest part. Once mm -hmm. I do that, I'm like, okay, now I can see your desktop. Now open up your browser and go to this. You know, I can, yeah. it's much more accessible if you're trying to help somebody troubleshoot something to see their screen. Earlier technology was just god awful. <laughs> and it's almost impossible to help them remotely. So I give teams props for making that thing a, a simple thing. Hey, morning, John Martin. Hey, how you doing? It's working out this fun stuff. Morning, Chris. How are you, sir? I'm all right. Do, do you have a camera or are you just shy? I'm just shy. Okay. I, I should put up a picture. Here's John Marsh. I'm just I'm getting ready to go to the memorial service for Don Marsh. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, pass along my condolences then. Absolutely. Uh, no, but I, I, I've seen you in here a few times now. It's good to have you join us. And uh, and yeah, Alan is, I think Alan is actually at his home. He's not in his truck. Correct. Uh, all right. I, I began to think you didn't have a home. You just. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a one day today. Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> but my candidate bailed out last night. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. You're doing the one day there. That's right. We've got it coming up here in a couple of weeks. I'm not. No, it's I'm down there in Portsmouth today. Oh, oh, the one in Portsmouth. Okay, yeah, that's a different one. Okay, are you? Are, 
Where do you live exactly? Because <laughs> I see you everywhere. I figured you live like Fredericksburg area. Correct. Okay. 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 Then. But the, the one in Portsmouth was the closest for us, most most available. Two lodges I belonged to. We each had a candidate. Okay. But my candidate bailed out. So. Ah, I see. Yeah, because Portsmouth does one, and then we'll have one for Norfolk. Uh, is I think in yeah next week I think. So, Chris, is it Owen today? Huh? Well, I, yeah, I was getting to that. Um, no, well, it is supposed to be Owen, uh, but now this is twice that he's canceled on me uh, with less than a week notice. So, <laughs> yeah, he says he's sick <laughs> and he can't be here. And I'm like, okay, um, well, I really don't think I'm going to reschedule him, at least not this no. year. <laughs> I jumped he's, actually, <laughs> he's online at the moment on Facebook. So. Oh, okay. I just sent him a message. Because <laughs> yeah. also, <laughs> he said he was sick, and like, okay, I'll let you out. So I went ahead and 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 grabbed something, and I was going to read a paper. Since Very wise. Here. So I need to have. And that's what I tried to. And I've I've tried to find amongst you all if there's anybody who has like a paper who would be willing to be like a backup to like have one ready if you show up. Like, hey, would you be willing to do a paper? I don't mind doing one, but I, I'd almost rather you know I'd rather host and have someone. So I need, I need to get uh, some pinch hitters who are willing to show up and just read a paper off the top. But not everybody's willing to do that, and I get that. So, and it's, oh, it's eight after. I don't know. I, I, once again, I never know how many people to expect here. Let me see. Yeah, my, last time I made a point of, of lining up another speaker, and I had to jump through hoops, and I changed the Facebook event and let everybody know that um, I was, you know, changing up the speaker, and this time I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to bother. If you show up, <laughs> but I didn't want to cancel either. But I have eight interested and one going me, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I, it's always like at this point, do I start with the five of us or do we uh, we vamp for a bit? So I, I will, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. I have enough of you here. Um, Here's today's question. Oh, yeah, let me do my official thing since it's like 10 after. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Virginia Research Lodge number 1777's unstated meeting for July 20th, 2024. My name is Chris Douglas. I am the senior warden and all around web person for Virginia Research Lodge. And it's good to see all of my brothers here today. Um, so, we're going to, I was explaining, we don't have a our regular speaker. I don't know where I'm going to edit this, so, you know. Um, but I do have a paper I'm going to give on John Dove. And um, But first, we're going to ask a question, see if anyone else comes in. Um, so <clears throat> every jurisdiction, generally, has appendant bodies. The Scottish Rite, the Royal Arch Commandery, uh, the Mark Master Mason, and other ones. So here's my question, for your, and this is for your jurisdiction. Ideally, I think every Mason should join other appendant bodies along the way, and he should make that decision himself. So my question is, let's assume for the sake of argument you wait at least a year before you go join something else. We asked that question before. What is the first appendant body you would recommend a new Mason join once he's in the Blue Lodge, and why would you recommend that one? Not altogether over your time of life, you might join as many as you want, but what would be the first one you're recommending to him join? Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, Royal Arch. Okay. And why is that? Because you have no choice. You really? Why is that? <laughs> That's the one that you, uh, you're normally expected to join once you've gone through the three degrees. Okay. I mean, literally expect that's that's pretty much yeah. standard. Okay. And, yeah, and how long? Obviously gone through now. How long after you're raised? Um, it can be as short as four weeks. Okay. And that's typical then? Okay. So you just feel like it's a continuation. Interesting. Yeah. But exactly. now you know that here, and, and one, by the way, one day we will have our big discussion about comparing uh, British uh, York Wright appendant bodies with American because we're very similar, but we're different. Um, you, we in the Royal Arch chapter have the Mark Masters, the first degree, and then the past master, and the last one's a Royal Arch. In England, 
just to, for those who don't know, uh, the Royal Arch is one append one body, and the Mark Master Mason is another body, which actually has two degrees, right? It's Mark. What is it again? They're, they're, what do they call the degrees? There's um well, it's basically Royal Arch and Mariner, and then Royal no, no, no. no it, in Mark, <laughs> in Mark Master Mason, there, there's two degrees. There's Mark Master and there's. In I have never come across a second degree um, or very to superior knowledge, but um, uh, I'm just going to check it. <laughs> I'm at, I'm at re I thought I read that somewhere that there's the mark. Well, anyway, the mark master degree is a separate body, but for yeah. us in the Royal Arch, we get the mark master first and then the Royal Arch later. You're yeah. saying typically you get the Royal Arch first, yeah, and then right. do a lot, or, and and then to get into the cryptic degrees, the council degrees. You must be both a member of a Mark Master Mason Lodge and Royal Arch. Is it a chapter also, or what do you call it? The Royal Arch. Uh, we call it chapter, but the most okay. important thing to remember is everything is invitation only. So it's not a natural progression. Everything if is. You do your third, you have to be invited to join. Oh, all of them. All of them. Yeah. Ancient and accepted, right? All of them. Everything. Oh. See, now that's something I didn't know at all. We are very um, few invitations. Upon saying that, I mean, uh, they're so short on members that it's not too difficult to get an invite. Yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, 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 and again, this is a, a tease for this upcoming program I promised to have. Mm -hmm. Of, y y like I said, we have the Royal Arch chapter, which has like, well, in Virginia we're different, but it has like four four degrees, and with the Royal Arch, and then you have the Council which has three degrees, which is cryptic degrees, and then you have the commandery. In England, you have the Mark Master Mason Lodge, you have the Royal Arch Chapter, and they're separate. You have to join both of them, and then you get the council degrees. Then you get invited a, to join the council degrees. Get invited, yes. But you have to have the other two first, is the point, yeah. before you can get them. Now, Virginia is unique in that we have the Select Master and the Royal Master inside of the chapter so you get six degrees so you get selected and royal master before you get royal arch and it's funny because if you pay attention when you're going through the degrees it's brother 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 companion select and royal you're called companion and then you're back to being brother for the most excellent master degree and then you're you become a companion at the end of the royal arch and when yeah. I ask people why, why do we call you companion in the middle? And most of them have no idea why. But that's because the degrees technically came after the Royal Arch degree. So we would be uh, brother and then immediately companion, which re as soon as you right. reach uh, chapter. And then right. okay. that's a brother again when you go into um, Mark. Right. Okay. Uh, Paul, in your opinion, what, what is the first dependent body a Master Mason should join? Which I haven't done yet. <laughs> you, I got I got put in the chairs. So, are you, uh, you are only a Blue Lodge Mason. You're not in any appended body. No appended body. Uh, wow. And how long have you been a Mason? What, six, seven years now? Something See, like that. you are a rarity. We need to uh, capture your DNA because you are a rare species <laughs> out there. <laughs> well, I, I ended up going through the chairs a lot quicker. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, believe yeah. it or not, people tend to join the appended bodies and still go through the chairs. And they end up getting in chairs in those appended bodies, too. <laughs> Which I don't uh, recommend. I, I plan to uh, go uh, take the Scottish Rite degrees. Okay. Well, my, you... my dad my dad, and my grandfather were Scottish Rite. Okay. Uh, right. My dad, uh, they were also Shriners, but uh, my, my, uh, my dad was in the clown unit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but... I got enough. I got more stuff on my plate that I'm not going to do Shriners. I understand. Okay. That's interesting. So do you intend to do? Oh, well, wait. Now you're, I'm sorry. And you are in, I, I can't remember everything about everybody. I'm sorry. You're in what, what state? What Grand Lodge do you under? Louisiana. Okay. Oh, Louisiana. And they do not require the past master's degree to be master of a lodge. Correct. Right? Do you have yeah. the past? Well, you have the past, you have a royal arch. So you have the past master degree. Well, you don't know that, baby. But I don't you, know that. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, okay, well, I will let you know <laughs> because you're under the Grand Royal Arch Chapter of uh, America. So, yes, uh, you would have four degrees in the Royal Arch and the Past Masters is the second one. So here in Virginia, you must have the Past Masters degree to be installed junior ward. 
So you either join a chapter or you get what we call a provisional lodge of past masters and you have the degree conferred on you. It basically prepares you for the chip. It's the idea. So, okay. So, um, so yeah, I'm, in a, I'm in the New Orleans area. Right. And uh, we're the ones with a, dis we got a district that's Scottish right on the first three degrees. Yes. And that's another something that I really want to do a paper on. You've recommended that brother. Um, who's the fellow? Michael Paul. Yeah. I want to get him. Well, if I can't, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's not. I don't know. I'd love to get him come in here and give a talk. He has a lot of YouTube videos on that about Louisiana masonry and the Scottish right and the whole, the cold other clandestine Supreme council running around down there oh, yeah. and regular blue lodges that do Scottish right ritual and, you guys got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So can you, how many Scottish Rite um, lodges, that, I mean, how many lodges that confer the Scottish Rite degrees uh, are there? It's a full district, and I think it's 10. Okay, all in one district, not all across the state. No, it's all in one district, uh, that, and they're all within the greater New Orleans area. Okay, and but they're part of your Grand Lodge. Yeah. So can you attend and watch those degrees? Oh, yeah, I've got an invite to go see uh, uh, Entered Apprentice, which I haven't done yet. Entered Apprentice okay. on Wednesday, but I don't know if I can make oh, that one. Okay, so you you received the what we call the York White degrees, yeah. the craft degrees. Right. But you can go yeah. watch them because you're a Louisiana. So I could do, I guess, because In fact, we've got a, each other. The, it's going to be a joint communication. Uh, we went for rent from another lodge, and mm -hmm. they every year they have a joint communication uh, with a Scottish right lodge uh germania lodge okay and they're uh they do one joint communication uh at at each other's lodge so it's uh so it's got two communi two combined communications uh once okay. a year that they do oh okay and you haven't been to those though and so they'll they'll open up and i forgot how how they do it they uh they'll open one will open up <clears throat> And their degree, and the other one will close in their degree. Hmm. That's cool. I would love to see that. I may have to travel there just to see that. Very cool. All right, Alan, who is also a Virginia Mason. What is, What do you think? What is the What is the first lot? What is the first pen body one should join after the Blue Lodge? Uh, correction, Chris. You have uh -oh. to be a past master to be nominated as a warden. Installed. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Elected, you cannot be elected junior warden until you receive you. That's correct. Well, you're typically elected and installed the same night, or at least within a couple of days. But yes, you're right. You can't even be elected to the chair. Correct. Thank you for clarifying. I was uh, my mentor decided that I was going to be a Shriner Scottish Rite Mason. Okay. That was the only slick, quick way to do it. Yes. In many in ways, way. I think right. it would have been better if I'd gone York Right. Okay. But not going to change at the moment because I'm too busy in the shrine and the lodge. Have you, do you, so you haven't joined the chapter yet? Correct. Okay. But, okay, so why do you think you'd be better off? Well, I think more, more, where the Scottish Rite has written knowledge, uh -huh. the York Rite has practical knowledge. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. And John Martin. Who is mostly a Virginia Mason like me, <laughs> partly a Utah Mason? Uh, what's your take? I, for, I guess I would say it's uh, got to be the preference of the individual Mason. Yeah, you know, that's not what we're asking. What would you mm -hmm. recommend if, if someone said, "Which should I join?" Someone asked your advice. I, I I don't really have an opinion. I guess I uh, when I I shortly after I became a Mason, I joined Scottish Rite and Shrine, but I never participated because I got really involved with a lot with my you know my Blue Lodge and uh, continued to be involved with Demolay and yep. Um, I'm now participating with York Rite and I'm enjoying it, but I don't necessarily have a uh, opinion. I guess one over the other. Okay. Okay. Oh. That's fine. I, I just, it, it came up the other day and I thought there'd be a good question for the group here just because it's like, you know, there, there is, there's, there's of course no right or wrong answer, but I mean, some people, I mean, I'm generally the opinion that Mason should go join all of, well, most of the appendant bodies along the way, at least the chapter in the Scottish Rite, um, because it, it makes him more well-rounded Mason, but the order in which you get them 
I don't know if it's that important either way, but if someone asks. Um, it's funny, we just wrapped up our Scottish Rite reunion here um, Thursday. Um, we did the 30, we finished the 32nd degree. And I had a I had the chance to give a talk at Corinthian Lodge, which is in our district, uh, last month. And I met a, a brother who um, was just raised that year. I think he was the junior deacon. And he wanted to ask me about about the Scottish Rite and the Royal Arch and Witcher Nerd Command. And we talked at length, and I talked a lot about the Scottish Rite because I'm more active in that right now. And I said, it's up to you, but I would say probably join the Scottish Rite first. But uh, the one, the piece of advice I gave him was, but you're new in the lodge, so the best thing you can do is be active in your lodge as much as possible and put off joining another body for at least a year. And then fast forward to June and the first night of our reunion, and he's sitting there in the class. And I said, okay, so apparently you didn't take my advice. <laughs> you went ahead and joined anyway. So I got back at him. I made him the aspirant in the 32nd degree. So he was the candidate. And I was like, you, you, want, it? you want the fire hose? Here you go. Here's the fire hose. So he got to be the guy led around in, in my degree, the 32nd that I'm in charge of. So, but I was like, I'm not, I'm encouraged that he's that motivated to, and I said, but just whatever you do, just don't forget your Blue Lodge first. I mean, you must, you must be active in the Blue Lodge, um, especially since he was going through the chairs, but it's like, you know, just make sure you allow time because everybody you join automatically, they're going to say, oh, you have a pulse. You need to be an officer. <laughs> That's what we do. We recruit you and put you right to work. So, um, other opinions on this? Other ideas about appended bodies or any other comments before I move on to the paper? No? Okay. All right, then. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. Okay. This is John Dove, and let me um, set up my paper. Did I go where you at? There. Um, I will say before I start, um, uh, John Dove, the reason this is, uh, th this, this, uh, my presentation is relevant, is in Virginia, we have an award which is sort of like a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's the highest award given by the Royal Arch Chapter, which is why I had the earlier discussion about the different appended bodies. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot something. Well, I won't bother with the U. You guys all know the, the link, so I won't bother with those. Um, so the John Dove Award is the highest award given by um, Virginia uh, Grand Chapter of Royal Arch. And so this is a paper written by, entitled John Dove, written by Robert S. Hughes, Jr. It was presented in Virginia Research Lodge in December 9th, 2000. And this is the a biography on the life of John Dove. Because many, obviously, Royal Archmasons ask the question, who is John Dove and why do we have an award in his name? <clears throat> John Dove was born in the city of Richmond, Virginia, September 2nd, 1792, living through the latter part of the 18th century and three-fourths of the 19th century, passing to the portals of death November 18th, 1876. Uh, this enabled him to know something of the habits character and changes occurring in the three generations through which he passed and adapt himself to the requirements of society while not compromising his views of duty. His early education was under a tutor who was a Scotsman and it is said he was rigid and exacting. Punctuality, attention to study, exact rendition of the task imposed, respect and obedience were demanded and he hesitated not to punish when duty was neglected. Doubtless at that time was the seed planted from which grew the system regularity and the punctuality which characterized Dr. Dove through his life. The profession which he selected was that of medicine. He began his study in Richmond and continued them at Jefferson College <clears throat> in Philadelphia and there received his diploma. 
He spent his professional life in Richmond, his native city, where he obtained a very extensive practice and continued it for nearly 60 years. When he gradually gave up his practice, he still continued the duties of physician to the city jail, to which he had been appointed for many years up to his last illness. His kindness and heart and manner of gentleness made him welcome visitor when sickness required his attention, and no father could exhibit more affectionate interest than did he when pain and suffering were present. This interest was not confined to any one class. To the poor and rich alike, he devoted his time and skill. Many a sufferer received not only his gratuitous medical attentions, but other benefits delicately bestowed by a tender heart and open hand. Dr. Dunn was annually elected for many years by the citizens of his ward. Richmond was under the ward system of government, a member of the city council. In every public situation, as well as city council, a man whose judgment could be relied upon for good and his influence was not exerted for any special locality, but for the public as a whole. In those days, the office sought the man and not the man the office. After declining to serve <clears throat> on city council, he was, against his wishes, elected a magistrate of the city annually for several years. On the bench, as he had been on council, the same clear-headed, conscientious man. He also took active interest in politics, attended public meetings, and often was selected chairman. In the tumult of large assemblies, his suavity of manner was unchanged. He never permitted his feelings to cause him to forget the character and conduct of a gentleman. Shortly after the inauguration of the Lancasterian School, Dr. Dove was appointed one of the Board of Trustees and elected secretary. He held these positions until that institution was superseded by the regular Richmond public school system. The hearty interest which he exhibited in the welfare and education of orphan and destitute children were marked as a trait of his character. No man could have been more solicitous, more zealous, or accomplished more good for this worthy institution than he, and more than one pr occupying prominent places as a useful citizen could point to the instruction received there as the starting point for good in their lives. Dr. Dove was for many years connected with St. John's Episcopal Church. He was often elected a member of the vestry and on several occasions represented that church in the Episcopal councils of the state having the support of the rector and the members. In his early life, Dr. Dove became interested in the subject of ancient craft masonry and took the first opportunity its laws would admit of uniting himself. When he arrived at the legal age of 21, he made application to St. John's number 36 for admittance and was accepted. In December 1813, he was initiated in an apprentice and in the early part of the following year passed to the degree of fellow craft and was shortly thereafter raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason. From that moment to the period of his last illness, he was active, zealous, and an influential Mason. Not being satisfied with bearing the name of Mason, he had once entered into diligent study and a careful analysis of the subject. The more he examined into and the better he understood the principles and objects of its organization, the more firmly he became convinced that no institution brought into existence by man was better adapted to his wants or more of elevating to his nature than Freemasonry, if its teachings were properly understood and faithfully adhered to by its members. With these impressions, it is not surprising that a man of his temperament, his industry, his reflexive mind, should have become ardent, zealous, and active in the perfection and the promulgation of its principles to his fellow men. Sixty-three years unbroken connection with Masonry gives strong and conclusive evidence of the firmness of his convictions when investigating the subject in the early part of his Masonic career. Day by day, year by year, for more than two generations, he continuously occupied Masonic duties, discharging his responsible trusts. The first organization of St. John's Lodge Number 36, in which our respected brother was brought to Masonic light, had but brief existence. The difficulty of obtaining and occupying for any length of time a suitable room for Masonic purpose embarrassed them to a degree that they determined to return their charter. In 1816, to the Grand Lodge of Virginia, whereupon many of its members, among them Brother Dove, made application to and became members of Richmond Randolph Number 19, in which lodge he continued a paying member during his life. 
He had been connected with that lodge but a short time when his merits attracted the attention of his brethren, who elected him to his various offices and finally elevated him to the position of worshipful master. It was no light honor to reach the position of worshipful master of any lodge in Virginia at that point in time, but especially was it a notable mark of confidence on the part of his brethren in his moral and Masonic qualifications to elevate him to the mastership of that lodge over which such men as Edmund Randolph, John Marshall, and other distinguished men of their day presided. Brother Dove was equal to the task, and under his guidance, the lodge maintained its prestige. It stood most high in the Masonic world as a bright, active, and zealous lodge, its members understanding and practicing those Masonic virtues so impressively and earnestly enjoined upon them by their master. More than once in the history of that lodge will be found that our brother Dove was called upon to discharge the duties of master. As a presiding officer, more especially of a Masonic organization, our worthy brother had but few equals. An interesting speaker, well-versed in parliamentary law and usage, and having thorough knowledge of the laws of masonry and the ritual, his memory active and retentive, his manner dignified, and possessing great firmness and voice, clear, distinct, and commanding. While enacting perfect order, no exception can be taken as to his manner of obtaining it. A few years had elapsed when his bright and inquiring mind became satisfied that discrepancies had crept into the ritual not consistent with ancient York masonry, and in order to be assured, he opened a correspondence with the distinguished mason Jeremy L. Cross, as well as other experienced and renowned brethren of the craft. Brother Cross was invited to Richmond, and was the doctor's guest during his stay. While here, a thorough examination of the work took place, and the exact rendering of the Smith Webb work, so-called York Masonry, obtained. Chapter Masonry and the Templar Orders also engaged their attention, and in order that might be perfectly disseminated throughout the state, the services of that bright and intelligent brother, James Cushman from the North, were obtained, who traveled through Virginia, by authority and imparted the perfect York work and ritual to various lodges, chapters, and commanderies also received the benefit of his instruction. To the untiring energy and unceasing efforts of Brother John Dove are we indebted for the consistent, beautiful, and perfect work now in use, and which in many instances has been transmitted to other states by Masons from Virginia. In 1836, a successful effort was made to institute a lodge on Shuck Hill, Shuck Ho Hill, lodges number 10 and 19, being too remote from the residences of many old masons for them to attend to their lodge duties. It was thought to adopt the name of St. John's Lodge number 36. Several of the former members of old 36 united with others in the application for dispensation of which Brother John Dove was one. Under that dispensation, they went to work and at the next Grand Lodge obtained a charter from which time to the present it has continued to work. It is reported that Brother Dove had in his possession the treasurer's book of the first St. John's Lodge, which he presented to the newly reactivated lodge. He was also elected an honorary member. St. John's Lodge was prosperous and had a large membership, and from it sprang other lodges. To it, Dove Lodge, so-called in compliment to the doctor, owes its origin, worshipful Thomas P. August being its first master. Fraternal number 53 was aided by Brother Dove, who obtained a dispensation as a charter. His name was added to his application. He was also elected an honorary member. On December 13, 1835, he was elected Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Virginia, succeeding Right Worshipful John Green Williams, the successor of Right Worshipful Gustavus A. Myers, who was elected to that office on the death of Most Worshipful William H. Fitzwilson, past Grand Master. For 41 years, our respected brother discharged the arduous duties of that office, involving, as it did, a large known domestic and foreign correspondence and the examination of voluminous documents with great skill, ability, and fidelity. In 1814, Dr. Dove received the degrees of Royal Arch Masonry in Richmond Royal Arch, Chapter Number 3. In that branch of Masonry, he also took great interest. His activity and intelligence soon made him prominent and sought after by his companions for office. He was elected and passed through the various stations of the chapter and in due time served as most excellent high priest. At the proper period, by virtue of his office, he most efficiently represented that chapter in the Grand Royal Arch Chapter of Virginia. The same spirit actuated him 
there as in the Grand Lodge, a seeker after light and knowledge, he desired that consistency in the work and ritual be obtained and that the sublime degrees of Royal Lodge Masonry should be properly understood, taught, and practiced. He perfected and published under authority of the Grand Chapter of Virginia a Royal Arch textbook which embodied the work and lectures of Royal Arch Masonry as understood and practiced in Virginia, aiding much in the preservation of uniformity. In November 1818, he was elected Grand Secretary of the Grand Chapter, succeeding Companion John Warwick, who had filled the office from 1808. The term of service for Companion Dove reached 58 years, and the record bears testimony to the remarkable fact that during this long time, he was not absent one night or day from his duties. As certainly as the Grand Chapter assembled, as surely would John Dove be met with and as surely and kindly give welcome as well to young as old Masons. Fifty-eight years is a long time to hold office and retain the confidence and affection of that body, which is continually changing year by year, and is remarkable that life should be spared and health given for the discharge of manual duty for that length of time. But for some wise purpose, he was with us, the Grand Secretary, and in that long life and multiplicity of duties, afforded an example worthy the emulation of his companions in masonry. In Richmond, Commander Number 2 in the year 1818, he received the beautiful and impressive orders of Templar Masonry. His membership in that commandery he retained to the day of his death, the latter part as an honorary member. Our brother, as a member of that body, lost not his interest nor lessened his labor in the other branches of Masonry. He took active interest in that commandery and served as his eminent commander, the duties of which he discharged most ably and his lessons made deep lodgment in the minds of those he instructed. When Richmond Commander Number 2 became dormant, he was instrumental in reactivating it as well as helping the Grand Commander of Virginia in reorganizing. At the reorganization of the Grand Commandery of Virginia, he was elected Grand Recorder, which office he was, with great unanimity, annually re-elected. From the Grand Commandery meeting in Alexandria, number 15th and 16th, 1876, he was absent for the first time after being elected recorder because he was on his deathbed. The Grand Commander of Virginia, in an historic move during its annual convocation, 1876, in Alexandria, Virginia, directed resolutions be prepared on the death of Sir John Dove, a portion of which is as follows. In years past, our brother has given evidences of a strong religious faith. On the very verge of death, but a few moments before life departed, he raised his hands to his forehead, feeling and knowing as a physician that it was death's cold sweat that rested upon him. He solemnly and impressively said, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And his voice was hushed to earth forever. Brother Dove was one of those selected by the Council of the 33rd Degree of the Southern Jurisdiction to be the head of the Scottish Rite Ritual, in the city of Richmond, and after taking the 32nd, was duly elected and appointed to be invested with the highest office of the 33rd. But from circumstances not mentioned, he did not present himself for investiture. During its annual convocation in October 8, 1975, the Grand Royal Arts Chapter of Virginia added to its standing committees a Distinguished Service Awards Committee and established a John Dove Medal as the award for outstanding and distinguished service to a Royal Arch Mason in Virginia. To be a recipient of the John Dove Medal Award is the highest honor bestowed on a Royal Arch Mason by our grand chapter. This is the author. It was my proud honor to become the recipient of this award at the grand chapter on October 25th, 1985 meeting in Williamsburg, Virginia. On November 16th, 1876, Brother John Dove departed this life. On the 18th, his remains were conveyed to the old church cemetery, accompanied by his affectionate family, relatives, a large number of friends, and the citizens en masse by St. John's Lodge, number 36, by companion Royal Arch Masons, and under the escort of Richmond Commander number two, the bells tolling a solemn requiem. The church building was filled to overflowing. The solemn burial services of the Episcopal Church were conducted by the rector, Reverend Brother A.W. Weddle, assisted by Reverend Messrs. Peterkin and Jacob Jackson. His body was then consigned to the last resting place of the dead, near the remains of his beloved wife, who had preceded him 12 years earlier. So, question? I, I didn't write it, but I can answer questions, comments.
anyone. <laughs> all right, come on. I'm doing all the talking here, guys. Somebody says something. <laughs> <laughs> no okay fine all right uh and that was okay i i enjoyed that paper um one th thought that struck me more of inside baseball stuff is i often think about when i write i write the way i speak and i have what i call but it's it's known as your voice if you if you are a writer for any length of time you develop your voice so other people who read it will recognize i recognize my voice in anything that i write I can see my sentence patterns and whatever. This brother has a much different voice in what he writes. When I was reading that, I was thinking of the paper I'm currently working on and thinking how different my tone, my voice is much more conversational. This was much more formal, I think, a little more a little more flowery than I do, which is fine. But I, it definitely struck me in reading this that the voice of the author, who is uh, Brother uh, Robert Hughes, yes, I've met I met him a handful of times. He's he's passed, uh, but a very different, um, a very different voice in his his writing style. Much more flowery, much more uh, oratory than than mine, which is much more conversational. That just an observation for me about the writing style. Um, John Dove was Grand Recorder, Grand Secretary, and Grand Secretary for our three York Wright bodies, Grand Bodies, at the same time, for like 50 years in each. So, yeah, I think he deserves to have an award. <laughs> uh, comments, guys? Anything? <laughs> Bill, come on, somebody say something. Uh, just uh, one comment. Yes. Um, <laughs> I went to uh opening of a cornerstone <clears throat> time capsule mm -hmm. at uh William D. White Lodge <clears throat> in Gretna, right. Louisiana, and found out that they're named after somebody who was not a member of the lodge. Uh okay. they named they named a lodge after uh William D. White uh because he was a well known and well beloved uh, Mason. Mm -hmm. And a secretary of my lodge, uh, uh, James Stanifer, uh, died at the beginning of COVID, of COVID, and um, was uh, also well loved in other lodges. And so they had were planning on starting a new lodge, and decided uh, after he passed to uh, they hadn't settled on a name, so they uh, decided to call it. Uh, named the lodge after him hmm. so another lodge uh, got started because uh, and named after somebody who was not a member of that lodge so I, I thought that was interesting yeah very cool um i will say about the john Dove award i mean it's we have um <clears throat> obviously the the royal arch is very similar in tone to i i think if you're used to the blue lodge the royal arch is very similar in the makeup it's like you know 10 or more active members, probably like 20, 30 total active, you know, that you'll see. It's a, it's, it, it feels more like a continuation of the Blue Lodge. Uh, whereas the Scottish Rite, you typically have 50 or 100 people, if, if you're doing well, at, at all the meetings. And that feels more like all of the lodges in the area got together for the Scottish Rite. It's like you see, it's like we guys got from this lodge to this lodge. It, it's more like a like a congressional meeting of all the different lodges of the Scottish Rite, as I kind of see it. It's like an overarching body, whereas the Royal Arch is more like, okay, you go from the Blue Lodge directly into the Royal Arch, and it's the same bunch of people. You know what I mean? It's almost like it, it's a different vibe in that sense. And in the Royal Arch, we we have high priests or, you know, worship masters or high priests and so on. So when we do introductions, um, when people are introduced, it's, you know, there are past high priests, there are past grand high priests or grand whatever, and and they will all, I, I remember hearing this early on, and recipient of the John Dove Award. So it is mentioned when you're introduced. I would say Paul Griffith, past high priest of Norfolk chapter number one and recipient of the John Dove Award. I mean, that is part of your introduction. 
that's why it stuck with me the first time I heard it when I got active in the chapter, because the Blue Lodge has awards, you know, more for the lodges than for individuals. We have, like, Master of the Year sometimes and all, but it's not something that you get a, permanently affixed to your name. <laughs> so the John Dover Award, that's why it always stood out of my mind, is that that's a huge deal. And they don't, I don't know that they actually award it every single year. I'm not sure. Uh, we do have a, what we call a perfect Ashler Award at the Grand Lodge, and they do tend to award one, maybe two a year, but not every year. Um, but it's not something that it's mentioned as part of your title, whereas John Dove is. So that's why it, it always stuck in my memory. That's why I was glad when this when I found this paper. It's like, I was curious, who's this John Dove character? <laughs> and why do we care? So uh, I think we all agree he definitely had a lucrative Masonic career. I mean, geez, you know, it makes me feel like I'm not doing enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, any other comments? Anybody? Anything else going on? Anybody want to talk about? Anybody want to mention? Chris, so. I, yes. Um, you may remember a couple weeks ago I asked whether or not you would have any objections to me publishing uh, print or in books on the Facebook page, the Virginia Facebook page. Yes, I thought I said. Just want to make sure you're still happy with that. Oh, absolutely. Um, Any, anything, yeah. if it's vaguely Masonic related, by all means. So the more content, the better. Okay, I've got about <laughs> three thousand. I'll uh, get rid of or get to publish somewhere. So oh, I'll okay. start on in the future. Alrighty. Yeah, Excellent. that look on your face says it all. Actually, oh my okay. god, three thousand. <laughs> okay. Um, I thank you. It's obviously. Um, so for those of you, this will be now. I have, I, I have really fallen behind. I think I have at least four or five unstated meetings that I need to commit to YouTube. I've been kind of busy with other things, so I haven't been able to work on that as much. So if you are watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. That helps us out. And uh, I do owe several. So this will be on YouTube at some point. So if you're seeing this in the future, I've gotten around to putting this one on YouTube. Uh, our next um, unstated meeting will be on August the 10th, and that is uh, Brother Taylor Kleinecht, who is, I think he previously was a speaker, uh, he will be speaking on network and pomegranates. Uh, this is a lecture on the topology of the social network of Freemasonry. It introduces network topology and looks at the social network that comprises the institution of Freemasonry and how understanding this network can provide insight into issues we face today. Um, I do apologize, Brother Snowden couldn't be here today. He was sick. He notified me earlier this week, and rather than cancel or try and scramble to find another speaker, I went ahead and pulled one of our papers out of the archives and read that. So I hope that was uh Good enough for y'all since our speaker wasn't here. Uh, we're proud. We're light today. There's only five of us today. Normally we got about 10. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's just a, it's the summer. I don't know. People are doing other things. Um, we do have, for those of you in person, um, our uh, research lodge will be meeting in person on August 17th. In uh, at Berkeley Lodge in Chesapeake, like we did last year. That's so, Alan. If you want to come down and join us, John, you're certainly welcome to join us. Um, I'll try and get the word out to the other lodges around us. Uh, but we'll be meeting at Berkeley, like we did last year. And Brother Jason Hicks, who is a member of the Grand, the, I'm sorry, the Research Lodge of Tennessee, uh, who is relocated in North Carolina now. Uh, he's been a speaker here in the um, Zoom meetings, and he will be coming in person to give us a talk, and I need to prep his, um, his uh, get an event out there with his information, um, and there's Brian's cat, <laughs> and uh, hang on, I'll tell you, Jason Hicks will be speaking on... Um, Oh, no, he didn't even give me that. Okay, he still owes me. Uh, <laughs> I need to get that together. What would we speak on? Always, always, always a good talk. Jason spoke on, um, in the past, on, uh, let's see. He was our speaker on, I well, know he was a speaker. 
Okay. I thought I had him. I'm sorry. I don't have that at my fingertips. But he was a speaker um, in the past for us. I think he speak on, on Sam on uh, Sam Houston in Texas, I think. Texas Mason. Oh, side note. When I was at um, Corinthian Lodge, where I met the brother who joined the Scottish Rite a month later, when I was speaking at Corinthian Lodge, there was a brother on Facebook who... Um, had said, is anybody doing, you know, are there any lodges meeting um, in the area? And I mentioned uh, Ruth because I was going to be the guest speaker that night. So he showed up and I got to talk to him. And there was another brother who showed up who is new to the area who is from Texas. And he's relocated, relocated to Virginia. And he was there to speak, uh, to um, vouch for a candidate they were going to uh, vote on that night. So it was kind of neat to meet new brothers. Um, also, uh, Michael Brewer, who I think has been to one of these Zoom meetings. I'm not sure. But I've known him on Facebook for a time. He is from um, Alabama. And his daughter is the grand worthy advisor of Rainbow in Alabama. And they are coming to Hampton for Supreme Assembly, which is the nationwide body of Rainbow for Girls that's meeting in Hampton this year. And he contacted me and says, Hey, you got anything going on Thursday night? I said, yes, we do. We have a 32nd degree. Uh, so please come out. So he drove in from Alabama to go to this other Masonic thing. And he came to our Scottish Rite and got to watch our degree. And I got to meet a brother on Facebook in person, which is always cool. Isn't it, Alan? <laughs> it's always cool to meet somebody in person. Alan's falling asleep over there. Alan. Yes. Means, yay. <laughs> Alan and I got to meet in person earlier um, this year. Or was it last year? No, it was this, this year. year. The Grand Master's uh, official visit to the different research districts. So I just want to say it, it's really cool to know so many people on Facebook and to run into them in person at some event is, is just always, always a thrill. So I think it's kind of cool in the last couple of weeks. That's happened uh, a couple times now. So I think it's awesome that we as Masons meet online, and then we get to come together and meet in person. It's it, it's always always an, a neat experience. And he he said he really appreciated, he really enjoyed it. It was great to be. And I was the degree master, so of course I said hi to him. And then he didn't see me again until after the thing was over because I was running around setting things up for the degree. And he said, "No, there are plenty of people here to talk to," and I was made to feel very welcome. So um, I felt like he was my guest, but I didn't get to talk to him until after. But we made him feel welcome. So, and it was a very effective degree. I was very proud of the team that's doing our our degrees. We did we did a great job, and that was a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, that's all we have. Then I look forward to seeing you all again in August for our next Zoom meeting. Thank you all, our loyal attendees, for attending. Uh, anybody got any final words before we sign off? Look, we'll be done before eleven. How about that? <laughs> all right. You brothers all have a wonderful weekend, and Thanks, I'll Rick. see you all soon. Thanks very much. Bye, mate. Thanks.